Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Now today my message is designed for two people, two kinds of people. One kind of person would be those that know for sure that if they were to die today, they'd go to heaven. How many of those are here today? Are you that one of those? You know you're going to heaven. Raise your hand. The second group would be for those who are still wondering, what does it take to get to heaven? Or maybe you already think you're going there, but you're not really sure yet. And I won't have you raise your hand because I won't embarrass you because you might be on that other side there. But if that's the case, the message is going to be for you as well. However, predominantly the message is going to be to come alongside those that already know Jesus Christ is their Savior. Now, what am I going to be doing to help them? We, because of God's love for you and our love for the Lord and for you, we want to learn how to, how did Jesus reach out and to touch lives with the simple message of salvation found in himself? So we're going to learn by observing what Jesus Christ did and taking from his life maybe some truths that might help us in connecting to those who don't. And those of you that don't know Christ as your Savior, I hope you're sitting back and you're saying, my, to be a part of a church that would love me enough to make sure that I would know accurately what the message is, how much that would mean to me. Now, with that, you might want to also know that this story is far larger. There's more involved in this real-life event than I have time to, to really go into. Because it talks about Jesus Christ and he's setting himself up for the lady at this well here, this woman at the well, to understand that he is the Messiah and he is God because that's the whole thing through there. The theme of the book is believing and that you might have life. And so we really want to see all of that. But I also want us to know that as we look at this life, we're going to see what he did with this particular woman. That's why I said, notice in this passage, you're going to see what we'll call the conversion of a woman. Basically a woman who finally understood who Christ was, trusted in him, and then went about and told others. The second thing we're going to learn is how Jesus really can meet the needs of this woman, surely, but everyone that would be out there. And then thirdly, back in the background will be his disciples and what's going on because there are some sub-messages, not less important, but kind of sub-messages to this bigger plot that's happening. And we want to be a part of that. Now, even though I'm going to talk about evangelism today, I think most of you have been through some evangelism training. And I believe in it. I, we have classes here. We encourage you to go to seminars. I've taught them. I've done them. Whether it's the Romans Road, Evan Tells Good News, Bad News, or whether it's the Seven Steps to the Plan of Salvation, or whether it might be the whatever is out there. Today, I'm not going to take you through a formula. One, two, three, bam, give them the gospel. What I want to do is cover, just for today, I want to cover kind of a a bigger picture. So in other words, instead of getting right into what's the exact word you say, I would rather show you what are the four areas here of how Jesus did this. Now next week when you come back, although the woman will respond to some of that, there's a bigger response that she gives, and I want to cover that next week because I want to show you three of her responses that are often the same kinds of responses that you'll encounter when you share the gospel with other people. So I think it will really help you. So if you had to really think about one word today, the one word I want to talk about is communication. Because you really can't give the gospel merely by living a separated life. Now I know it's important, I don't want to put that down. In fact, we give the gospel in our own lives also, Paul says. But it's not just about our life. We can be a great Christian, we never smoke, drink, chew, or go with girls who do. But that doesn't mean we're getting the simple plan of salvation out, All right, Telephone poles are like that. They don't smoke, chew, or go with girls who do. But they're not giving the gospel out. On the other hand... You can be out there, like I've been on Waikiki, you've been there too. There's some people, and I bless their hearts, they're bolder than I am, or maybe more nuts than I am, I don't know. But they're on the corner there of Kalakaua and one other street, and they got a bullhorn, and they're just shouting out to people, you know, turn or burn, try or fry, forsake or bake, or whatever they're saying. They have very few people around them, except maybe a heckler, maybe someone who's maybe another language wanting to know, what in the world is this uh, street man doing here? I I want you to know, though, that there is that tender relational evangelism through communicating the message. And so it's through relations. And we're going to show you, though, that sometimes that can be very, very difficult. Now, to do that, I don't want to just kind of give it a lick and a promise, so that's why we're going to try to keep it within a timely manner. I want to thank my staff for taking down our clock in the back so I can just preach as long as I want to. And uh, we will turn to John chapter 4 in your Bibles, if you will. You could follow along in your uh, worship folder if you want. It's there. 
But I really want to thank all of you for bringing your Bibles because nothing's better than you have your own Bible with you. Get a good study Bible. Make sure you write in the notes. The uh, paper is not sacred. It's God's Word that's sacred. So you can write all over your Bible that you want and take all the notes that you'd like. Now, to really set you up for the real dynamic of what's happening in this story about how Jesus communicated the good news, I need to give you what I call a backstory. So I won't take long, but I want to take just John chapter 4, verses 1 through verse 4, because we're doing an exposition of John, Gospel of John. You'll notice that he just finished up with some major things there with John the Baptist's testimony, etc. He was in Jerusalem, then he moved out of Jerusalem, went to Judea. You remember that there was some challenges going on between the disciples of Jesus, so to speak, and John's disciples. And so now here's what happens next in verse 1. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So let's just pause for a moment on that. I asked myself the question, why did he leave John the Baptist in Judea and he started to head towards Galilee but had to go through Samaria? One of the reasons could be is that Jesus knew that the two disciples, that his disciples and their disciples, were really not in competition, but they were still trying to sort things out. And the best thing to do sometimes to end conflict is to separate for a while. There was no love lost through all that, nothing bad about it. It was just a separation that was going on. There's another thing going on, and if you really study a little bit further, you're going to find that Jesus didn't want to encounter all the challenges from the Pharisees just yet. That happens a few chapters later. So when he gets further into the story, he'll, he wants to do it then. But right now, something else had to happen first. So the best way to do that is to leave John the Baptist in Judea and head towards Galilee. But here's something that's a side note in this passage. You'll notice here it says John the Baptist, excuse me, Jesus and his disciples were baptized, but not Jesus. Here's what you need to know in evangelism on this verse alone. If Jesus said that you had to be baptized by immersion in order to go to heaven, it strikes me really curiously here, why didn't he baptize then if it was so important? Because, remember, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And while he is doing this, he's giving the message of salvation by faith alone. He talks about the importance of baptism. He himself was baptized, but he never went out and did that. So I think that's just one of many reasons why baptismal regeneration, they call it, is not really biblical. So mark that down, continue your study, but there's one that might help you answer the people that think that there are. If baptism, if salvation was by baptism, immersion, etc., then why didn't Jesus do it if it wasn't so important? But now here's another phrase here in verse 4. It says, and he had to pass through Samaria. All right. I'm going to take some time here. And you're going to see it more when I read the verse, but I want to give you some backstory of the history of what's going on so you know this. Some of you already know a little bit about it, but you might not know why. Let's ask the question. How many of you know that Jewish people did not have a good relationship with the Samaritans and they really avoided Samaria? How many of you knew that? All right, raise your hand. See, doesn't mean I can't teach that, but if I asked you, how many of you really know why there was that problem? Only a couple of you might. But here's why they had that problem. Let's take you all the way back, and first of all, if I had a map up here, you would see it. You have Jerusalem, then you have the outskirts of Jerusalem, kind of like the uh, areas out here that would be called Judea. Galilee is way up on top, so he's now heading out of the Judea countryside, and he's going north. Now, Samaria is in, is in the middle there, so to speak, middle, in, anyway, between the two. Back in the Old Testament, you'll remember there was a time that the, the, the kingdoms were divided, that happened right after Solomon. So you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So you have north and you have south. When they were divided up later on, further on down the road, those Jews then were taken captive to a place called Babylon and Assyria. We'll just kind of basically say it was kind of near Iraq, all right? So they kind of headed out that way. And so the land was pretty well taken of all the people. Not everybody. Some were left there still in that area. Well, after a while, the king changed his mind over in Assyria, that area, so they started to come back into the area again. Some of the people came back, but a lot of the Assyrians themselves moved into the area. So here's what happened. There was what was known as mixed marriages. The Jews that were left there began to intermarry with the Assyrians and others, which was totally against the law. So you had an ethnic hodgepodge soup bowl there of people. Well, now when the Jews are coming back, they're realizing, hmm, something's going on here. We've got this mixed multitude. We're in here. They finally get there, and the mixed multitude, we're going to basically call ethnically mixed there, said, we want to be a part of building the temple in Jerusalem. Ezra says, no, read it. Nehemiah, in his book, no, can't do it. Because, again, they didn't want to have the Samaritans who were already living in violation of the law to build their temple. 
So then they got all upset because the Jews wanted to do it and keep it purified. They had their own view of Judaism, which was, we'll believe the first five books would be the Pentateuch teachings, although they didn't have five books back then. But all that teaching that's found in our five books, they believed the rest of it was kind of, eh, that's not important. So they didn't have that. So they created their own worship, their own priests, their own doctrine. And then they wanted to build their own temple, which they did, which is up near Mount Gerizim. So now they're building their own temple, so there's this big hatred thing going on. The Jews are saying, we don't want a part of you, you're not a part of us, you're, you're kind of like a, um, you're an anomaly of who we really are. The Samaritans are saying, but we wanted to come in here, now look at what you're doing, we have our own religion, you're dissing us, but we have part of it too, we should be a part of that inheritance, so now you've got this big divide going up. It was so bad, as it went hundreds of years now toward the New Testament, that the Jewish people, only if they absolutely had to go through Samaria, they did. But by far, the majority, majority of them, when they wanted to go to Galilee, there's three ways to get there. One is to go out by the sea this way. It took many, many days. They often didn't go that way. They could do from Jerusalem to the area of Galilee. They can do a straight line because it's quicker to do that, but that's through Samaria, so that's no good. So they generally would go down through Jericho, out along, cross over the Jordan, go up the other side near Perea, come back in again. That would take about twice as long to do that. Now, this verse here says, and Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, those of you that think, oh, he was in a hurry because he really wanted to diddly bop over there to Galilee, I don't believe that he had to get to Galilee because he was in a rush to get there. In fact, when I did a study on the he had to do something, it's always in the context of other passages where he had to do the Father's will. There was something God the Father wanted God the Son to do in fulfilling. And generally, it was wrapped around what we might now call the Great Commission. So what I'm going to do, taking from all these other verses to say, when Jesus had to go through Samaria, it was because, obviously, global evangelism was in mind so that people, even in Samaria, would know that he is the Messiah and that he is God. That's for another sermon, but that's the truth. But to do that also, he was going to model for us evangelism against all different kinds of people groups that we might come against so that we know that the gospel is not just for us for no more shut the door or for our own private little ethnic group or only for the Jews. It's for everybody. Let me qualify that only for the Jews. We do know that the writings came from Jewish people. Jesus was a Jewish savior, etc. So it is coming out of the Jews, but it's not only for the Jews. It's for everyone. Now, most of you might already know that. But there are a few that are listening that are here today. That this is all new stuff. So now, are you with me? Say, uh-huh. Okay, good. Now let me come up for air just a little bit. Especially for those of you that are new in your journey. This stuff here that I gave you was, ooh, that's kind of interesting. But I don't think I got all of it. Who's the Assyrians? And what about that? I don't get this. Do you know that I was not reared in a Christian home? When I got saved, I knew that I was lost going to hell. I thought it was by good works. Carol at the time gave me the gospel. It was by faith alone. I trusted Christ. I got my first Bible and I thought it was all in alphabetical order. And it wasn't. It's all, you know, it's in all different order. Chronologically, it's pretty good. But let's get back to this. So you know how I learned it? By being faithful at every time I knew the Word of God was being preached. Where I knew it wasn't just a fellowship of fun and games and Christian activities, although that's not bad. But my highest priority with the limited time was, I'm going to put myself underneath this book. And I knew, here it is, here it is. It's stupid, I know. But the more mud you sling against the wall eventually the more that's going to stick. So I wanted as much, not that God's word is mud, but as much of God's information thrown against my mind because I knew some of it I wouldn't get over my head. But I knew the more I'm around it, soon I got it. And over the years after study and Bible studies and seminary and all of that, more and more I'm learning. And folks, look me right in the eye. Do you know that I am still learning? I get so excited about what insights the Lord has given to me. I can't wait to preach and to teach. I told Carol yesterday, I said, do you think we could have a Bible study in our home? And how about a Sunday school class? And maybe people would come on Sunday night and maybe Wednesday night. And my poor wife was grabbing her nitroglycerin tablets, you know. I just, it's not that I'm great. It's God's word is so good and it's affecting me in such a wonderful way. And I want to share it with you. Now that being said, so now he had to go to through Samaria to get to Galilee. Now, we'll talk about Galilee weeks down the road, but right now, he's into Samaria. A couple other things, and then we'll leave that thought. In Samaria, the whole area is called Samaria, so think of the, of the term, some area. Say that with me. Some area. So it's a big area. However, the little fly here is that there was a little town, city called Samaria. Since then, we don't see the town. It's the area called Samaria, but the particular area that Jesus is going to pop into and stop for a while 
is Sicker or Syker, however you want to pronounce it. And we're, we're going to go ahead and talk about that little place. That's not the capital, but it's a pretty profound and important place in all of Bible history because it deals with oh, Wells and Jacob and Joseph later on and some of these guys that you've heard about. It's all part of the story. So that's the back story here. Now let's go over our points, if you will. What I want to do is I want you to remember four letters, and each letter is going to represent a word. And so this is kind of the concept of what you're listening and working with when you come alongside someone that you know doesn't know the Lord. I'm going to give you the four words, so in case you kind of zone out and you miss my blanks, you can have them. The four words are heart, mind, desire, and conscience. Heart, mind, desire, and conscience. You can write that down. So just remember, H-M-D-C. Say that with me. H M C D C, heart, mind, desire, conscience. What we're going to talk about is that when Jesus approached this person from the passage, it's pretty easy to see that he is appealing to her heart a little bit. And so when you talk to someone, you really want to touch their life before you ask for their hand. So you touch a heart before you ask for a hand. So what you're really doing now is touching their heart. We'll talk about how he did that in a moment here. Not that we have to do it exactly, but think in terms of when you build a relationship with someone, you want to start touching the heart. But then you can't just do the heart because that's all felt stuff. And felt stuff changes. So now you've got to go to the mind. There's a great book I urge you all to get and read. It's called by J.P. Moreland. It's called Love the Lord Thy God with All Our Heart, Soul, and Mind. And the emphasis in that book is loving Him with your mind. How important it is to know Him intellectually as well as in your heart, spirit, and life. The third word is you want to go beyond the, the mind now. Now you want to get them to make a decision. So you're, not a, you're, you're speaking to a desire. What do you really need? What, what are your needs? What do you desire? But then you end up with a conviction, and we're going to call that that bit of conscience that happens because now it's usually at that stage when they really have a conviction that this stuff is true, it is true for me, and therefore I've got to deal with it because there are, here it is, consequences that the person begins to change. And so while I'm not giving you how do you open a conversation, how do you close a conversation, what do you say, I'm going to go over those four areas this week, and then we'll talk about how she responded to it next week. So let's talk about appealing to her heart. How did he appeal to her heart? Well, here's how I think he did. All right, verse 4, and we're going to follow along now to maybe verse 9. I'll just kind of read it and then comment as we go along. Verse 4 says, and he had to pass through some area, Samaria. And then it says, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the part parcel of the part of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph and Jacob's well was there now let's just pause for a moment what is interesting folks is that there are a lot of places in in Israel in the Middle East that are called according to tradition that means most people kind of assume it's there so they call it according to tradition ATT We've hosted three trips there. We brought Charles Ryrie with us one time and others, Jimmy D. Young from a Day of Discovery television program. And a lot of those spots, they're going to say, according to tradition. The best I can get, I believe that this particular well that we're talking about right here really does exist in this little town, a little bit out, about a half a mile outside the town in Sychar today. There is some kind of a churchish, orthodox church thing over it, but there is that well there. And when the archaeologist uh, identified that being that particular well, they really believe it is because there are no other wells outside the city, as this one would be, that they could find ever dug except this one. This well probably had to be between 50 to 100 feet deep. In the context, he's going to talk about rivers of living water. This particular well isn't a well that they sink down into the ground. All the, the, the uh, ground above, above ground water kind of rolls and flows into this little well. And you've got this murky thing that people scoop out their buckets with and get some water. This particular well is fed by an underground stream. So while it may go up or down based on much water, it's still a spring-fed well in this thing. So I believe it's still there. Now, there's a lot of story. You might say, why did he say Jacob and Joseph and all this kind of stuff? He's building his case about crossing over ethnic lines. And you're going to see something at the end of this sermon, if I have enough time to get to it, and you're still awake. I want you to catch this because it's going to show you how significant this is, that he brings this little known truth out, which now tells me, bigger picture, is that he's just letting us know this is the inspired word of God that every jot and tittle, every dotting of the I and the crossing of the T is inspired of God. It's important and there's probably more truth in that than we'll ever be able to plummet in a lifetime. All right, let's go a little bit further. So now we pick it up here at, at the end of verse or middle of verse 6. It says, And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Obviously he would be. He's traveling over here from Judea. He's going up through Samaria. He's up to this town called Sychar up there. 
And now he's stopping. Now, it says the sixth hour. Now, I'm not going to debate this thing. You have a Roman calendar, you have a Jewish calendar. The bigger question is, is John the Baptist referring to a Jewish calendar? Or is he referring to the Roman calendar? Because the sixth hour is different times a day based on Roman or Jewish. All right, so here it is. The Jews would generally look at six hour would be when sun comes up. Or in other words, when there's daybreak. Then they start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it would be about noon. So if you believe that, Jesus finally arrived at the well. It's noon. It's the hot part of the day. If you want to take the Roman persuasion, the Romans started their calendar about noon and they went down to 6 p.m. That too could be the same thing. It's a little cooler during the day. Maybe that's why she walked over there to get her water. Later on, we're going to find out what kind of a woman she was. And maybe that affected maybe what time it was. I don't think we need to fight over the exact, was it 12 noon or 6 o'clock? What we do have to believe, whether it's noon or even later in the day, we know that our day heats up starting about noon and it's still very hot by 6. We also know that she went to the well probably when there wasn't a lot of people because of her past reputation, especially with men and probably also the outcast of other women. So she went up there to get her water with her own water pot to do that. And Jesus was there. Now here's something else in this passage that might help some of you that are still trying to sort out this Jesus thing. Jesus is all God and he is all man. There are some people that would like to make him so much God that he's not a man on the earth, he's kind of like an angel. You know, you see pictures and they got all this aura around him. You go into these cathedrals. I don't read too much between that word, but cathedrals that have all these stained glass windows and they'll show Jesus and he's got this halo and he's got all of this and he's here on this earth. So they almost make him this mystical figure of God on the earth. They leave out his humanity other than he kind of looks like a guy because he's got a beard and hair. Others, they don't want to see him as deity, so they just see him as a man. The beauty of scripture is to see both because he really is both. He is all God and he is all man. In this context, for this very moment in this verse, we're also seeing the fact that he was all man. And that's kind of important too because when he went to the cross, it wasn't that God died on the cross. God never died. Jesus died on the cross, but God can't die, and he didn't die. So you still see it all together. And I don't have time to show you all of that in Scripture. That's Christology, and some of you have taken our Bible study course here, Bible doctrine class, so we can go into that. But right now, just know, he was tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He wept. He was tired. He slept. And so in Scripture, if you go through Scripture, you're going to see the humanity. So when you see that, do not discount his deity. When you read about the things he did as deity... Walking on water, raising the dead, healing people, doing miracles. I don't want you to then minimize his humanity because he was also human at the same time. So let's go back to the passage. So now he's coming up to the well about the sixth hour. This woman is now soon to arrive and try to uh, get into a conversation with him. And verse 7 says, And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Some people think, well, that's why he was there at 6 o'clock at night, because they're going out to get food for dinner. Others think it's a little ways into town. They had to shop, so he went at noon, so they'd have a late afternoon snack. That's too much information. I I don't really know. You decide and write me an email and give me your point. Okay, give me a drink, he says. Now, before I go any further, let's talk about that for just a second. There's, there's so much into that, it's, it's unreal. The first thing I'd like to say is, there's two kinds of evangelism. There's a in-your-face evangelism, where you just kind of go right into the gospel. Hi, how are you? Fine, John 3.16. You know, I, I, don't, I don't like that. You know, my, my wife has a wonderful phrase she uses when she works with people on evangelism. She says, never witness to a stranger. Always make them a friend. So in other words, what she's saying is, build a relationship with them. In fact, there was a book written about 15, 20 years, maybe longer ago than that. It confronted those people that would go door to door and give the gospel, go door to door. And they said, we need to do something called friendship evangelism. And I kind of like that term. So the whole emphasis was, make them your friend before you evangelize them. I like the book, but I think there's, that could also throw us to an imbalance. First is over here is evangelism without any relationship. Then you have others. We spend so much time building a relationship, we do very little evangelism. So it's not friendship And it's not friendship evangelism. It's friendship evangelism. So I would like to tell you, as as important, as as easy as it is to go to your neighbors with whom you probably already have some hopefully good relationship with them, that you give them the gospel. But there could be times when you're on a bench, or maybe, in this case, you're at our own version of the well, and it's going to be a counter at McDonald's. 
and there'll be someone next to you. Or the rocking chairs over at the Moana for us older people that walk there and have to sit there for a while. Anybody could be there. Jesus then launched into a relational conversation, which means, here it is, the secret of evangelism is opening your mouth and communicating the gospel. That's the simple part of evangelism, and that's what Jesus did. Now, when you read this here and you see this, you think, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, he talks to her about the gospel. He would. He's God. He's Jesus. He should do that. Now you've got to take it back into context again and realize what stuff is really going on here. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.